the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. It is being widely reported, not only in the Catholic media, but in the secular media as well, this past week, that a recent poll of Catholics in the United States at least those who identify themselves as Catholic, reveals that seven out of ten Catholics, and I put that in quotation marks, seven out of ten Catholics do not believe in the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist. Put another way, my way or the church's way, seven out of ten Catholics are not Catholic. You cannot be Catholic and not believe in this fundamental reality, this dogmatic truth, this biblical truth of the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist. I'm not certain if that 7 out of 10 can be identified with those who go to church versus those who don't. Because elsewhere I have read that about 75% of Catholics don't even go to church in the United States. There's probably some overlap, in which case it's probably true that 75% of Catholics don't even go to church. And among those that do go to church, there's a certain percentage that still do not believe in the real presence of Christ in the Holy Eucharist. Looking out at this congregation, I think we're doing a lot better statistically. I'd be surprised if one out of 70 or even one out of 700 who attend this church do not believe in the real presence of Christ. And if that is the case, and you're here today, you probably accidentally stumbled upon this church. And if you don't believe in the Holy Eucharist, please, please, please do not come to Holy Communion and speak to me after Mass, and maybe I can help you with that. Jesus looked over the city of Jerusalem and wept. That is the gospel reading of this Mass. Jesus looks down from heaven upon the United States, and I'm sure much of Western Europe as well, and at least figuratively he weeps. Jesus wept over the ancient Jewish temple, that within one generation would be crushed into rubble. Jesus looks upon the church in the United States and in other parts of the Western world, and at least figuratively, he must weep for the deplorable condition into which we have fallen. You know, on the exterior of that temple, It was a magnificent structure, and it was ornate, and it was one of the wonders of the world. But inside it was rotten. It was supernaturally nearly lifeless. And for that reason, Jesus warned it would go down. You know, when I was growing up, I grew up in a beautiful church. It was Baroque. It was in another part of the city. But when I was about 12 years old and the revolution was kicking in, the revolution of the 60s, we were all told that our church would temporarily close for six months to a year because it was going to be renovated. And after several months, finally the church reopened and I was a young boy of 12 or 13 at the time. 
I remember when I first stepped back into the church, which looked identical from the outside, still had the wonderful facade. When I stepped into that church, and I literally thought that I had stepped into the wrong place. I remember thinking, even as a boy, where is my church? Must have been like Mary Magdalene saying to the one she thought was the gardener, where have they taken my Lord, the body of my Lord? I was wondering, where have they taken my church? It had not been renovated, it had been wrecked. It had been gutted. All of the beautiful paintings of the angels and the saints that had adorned the walls and the apse, gone, plastered over and whitewashed. The beautiful high altar, the priest had ascended at mass, gone. Instead, a wooden table stood in the midst of the sanctuary. The beautiful floor that I had walked for the early years of my life, covered over in green carpet, a carpet of about the color of a nice green golf course. Those wooden pews identical to those that you are sitting in now, gone. Replaced by brown plastic chairs. And of course, no kneelers. The beautiful crucifix that had once been behind the high altar, gone. Replaced by some monstrosity that looked like a burned corpse on a tree with bicycle reflectors at the ends of what was alleged to be a cross. And no tabernacle. Yes, they truly had taken the body of the Lord, the real presence of Christ, and hidden him in a closet back in the busy sacristy where no one would bother to go for some quiet prayer. In a matter of months, they had taken the beautiful house of God and turned it into something entirely, entirely different, a monstrosity. And if that wasn't enough, one pastor later, some 25 years later, they decided to wreck it a second time because it still had too many of the trappings of the sacred. There was still a separate sanctuary area for the priest. Oh, there was no communion rail, there was no barrier. But now they wrecked it a second time and they put the priest and the table in the center of the church with everybody around him. And he didn't even have his own chair. He sat in a chair with the people and would only stand to go to an altar or to a podium when he needed to speak or act. I grew up as a boy in a church known as St. Thomas the Apostle. I will never go back into that church, which I now refer to as St. Thomas the Apostate. Is it any surprise with what has been done to churches, to the sacred liturgy, and to nearly every other aspect of Catholic life that we are now at a point where a majority of self-identified Catholics do not even believe in the real presence of Christ. In which case, if they even bother to come to Mass, they don't believe in what we are doing. They don't believe that this is a sacrifice. Whatever else that it might be, whatever Protestant ideas they might have, it is not a sacrifice in their minds. It is not a Mass. It is not Christ. But this has been engineered by modernists 
going back decades. And when you change church architecture, you change the interiors of the church so they no longer reflect the sacred, when you change the sacred liturgies, when you attempt to change the teachings of the church, when you attempt to change the traditional practices, what are you left with? You're left with nothing. You're left faithless. You're no longer Catholic. God always leaves a remnant. Catholicism, that is the new covenant, was built on the small remnant of the faithful Jews. And it blossomed into a universal worldwide church. But that temple and the old ways went down. The remnants survived intact and it brought the gospel to the ends of the earth. In every apocalypse or end, there has always been a remnant. And there is a remnant now but what we don't know is what God's providence intends. Does he intend a cleansing such as Christ did in that temple where he drove out the money changers and the sellers of goods, drove them out in a symbolic act of the cleansing of the temple and bringing it down to rebuild upon the remnant in its place? Is God intending a cleansing of the temple and the remnant will need to remain intact to rebuild the church? Or is this the final apocalypse? Is God intending to bring down one final time into rubble every church and the entire world? In which case the remnant is still important it remains important to remain solid and persevere in the one true Catholic faith. It just means that the remnant will not be rebuilt. And if I may use a term that has been misused by many non-Catholics, the remnant will rather be raptured. Not raptured in the sense that the evangelicals speak, in the sense that St. Paul speaks, that when Christ comes in victory and power at the end of time, the remnant that has been faithful will be raptured up, body and soul, to be with Christ, the angels and the saints, with the Holy Trinity for eternity. I don't know and neither do you what providence intends. Are we coming to a cleansing? Are we coming to the end and the ultimate crushing? I don't know, and I don't know when, and I don't know how, and I don't know which. But I do know this. Either way, it is important that there be the remnant of the faithful and that you and I be among them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.